Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I'm a former assistant director and your host. My guests today are from the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. First, Tommy O'Donnell, you're the director of the Teamsters Motion Picture and Theatrical Division, and you're the president of Local 817 in New York. Welcome to Below the Line. Thanks, Skid. You're happy to be here. Glad you're here as well, Tommy. Next, Steve Dayan, you're the secretary treasurer for Teamsters Local 399, based in Hollywood. Welcome. Thanks, Skid. Good to be with you. And finally, Lori Ward, you're the movie director for Teamsters Canada and the principal officer for Local Union 155. Nice to have you. Good morning, Skid. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Well, I really appreciate all of you taking time today to discuss the pandemic and how it's affecting your members. Before we dive into that, let's first talk about the extent of that membership in the entertainment industry. Well, Teams to Local 817 was initially chartered in 1926 in the days of vaudeville as an entertainment-only local, actually born in Hell's Kitchen. Initially represented uh, motion picture and, and theater workers, as well as concert workers. Over years, grew to incorporate you know, commercial as well as television. Today, the locals listed at a little under 1,700 members, actually, as of March 13th of this year, we had over 2,000 people working. Most of our are in transportation, um, but we also now represent casting directors and associates, which are about 120, and about 700 location workers, about 70 of them in commercials, and the rest of them in motion picture and television. Well, thanks for that, Tommy. Steve, over in Hollywood, is it the same membership or are things different? It's, it's basically the same uh, membership. We too represent uh, casting directors and location managers, as well as drivers. We, we do have some classifications that I don't know uh, that Tommy or Lori have, and that those are our animal handlers uh, and trainers and wranglers. So uh, obviously Westerns in the uh, back in the day were big in Hollywood. Uh, so we uh, were the people, so if you have cattle or horse, uh, people or dogs or bears or tigers, uh, those crafts are represented by our members. We also have uh, some white paper contracts. We represent some vendors in the film industry uh, like Cinelease, uh, Coyote Studios, uh, their grip and lighting departments, and uh, Herc Entertainment. So we have those. We have a little over 5,000 members uh, in our local union, uh, about 5,200, and we were chartered in 1928. And Lori, does Canada take a similar approach, or I can imagine some things are different, but tell us more about your local and the Canadian film representation in general. Yeah, well, Local 155 was chartered in 1987. It actually, uh, prior to that, it was uh, part of the construction local 213. We have incredible growth in the last five years, um, but we are a standalone movie teamster local. So we have 1,800 members uh, uh, presently, just over that. Uh, we represent a different group too. Uh, we represent drivers, uh, security, catering, animal handlers and wranglers, uh, mechanics. We have a miscellaneous division and uh, we have a marine division. Uh, we also, we're, we're different here is uh, there's a BC Council of Film Unions and uh, Teamsters Local 155 uh, is part of a film council that's made up of uh, three unions, uh, I IATSE 891 and ICG 669, which is the camera local. So. Uh, with that, uh, there's a collective master collective agreement that's bargained uh, independently with that group. Uh, so you work with some of the other unions in Canada as well to to work on those agreements. Yeah, uh, this this that's specific to uh, British Columbia, the province of British Columbia. So the BC Council of Film Unions, and other than that, uh, the representation of drivers across Canada is uh, is mixed. Uh, if you go east of Alberta, it's a it's a different uh, it's different altogether. It's actually uh, IATSE that's uh, driving uh, past Alberta. Well, that brings up the my next question. I imagine that lots of folks who do these jobs in the entertainment industry that are not specifically part of your local, do largely to geographical concerns. Are they still often represented by Teamsters or are there non-union shops? Like how is how does it work for those folks in the industry? At other locales, there will be generally transportation and motion picture and television, and to a lesser extent commercials, is represented by 
by Teamsters, it's, it'll be in mixed locals where they'll have a variety of other industries. Obviously, so much of it is now centric to successful film tax credits. So you'll see you know, a sizable craft unit in um, New Orleans, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Chicago, Boston, Albuquerque, Mexico. Yeah, the, the same thing. Uh, jurisdictionally, it's it's different, you know, throughout North America and, and uh, Canada is no different. Obviously, the industry in British Columbia um, is quite, you know, significant as opposed to other parts of Canada, saving except Ontario. Just so you understand, Skid, the we're the only craft locals. These three locals in the Teamsters are the only craft locals in all of the Teamsters. There are 1.4 million Teamsters, and uh, there are three true craft locals in the film industry that were established only to service film and television. As uh, Tommy mentioned, the other locals are general locals, so they do UPS drivers and you know, uh, concrete drivers and sanitation, as well as uh, motion picture work in their jurisdictions. So our contract, the, the 399 contract in Hollywood covers the 13 Western states and some of Canada as well. Uh, so uh, that's the geographic jurisdiction of local 399. 817 covers six uh, Mideastern states from Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and the eastern half of um, Pennsylvania. Laurie, how, where do you extend to? Yeah, I should add uh, local 36. So for local 15, it's the province of British Columbia and Yukon territories. Uh, and the other uh, jurisdiction for Teamsters is the neighboring province of Alberta, and that's local 362. I will say that while the classifications that we represent for the most part overlap, as Steve said before, in New York, we don't represent Wranglers. Um, we don't actually at this time represent catering. We do represent um, legitimate theater, such as Broadway, all the major concert halls in the metropolitan area. We get a significant amount of work out of that, the transportation to and in and out of. And, and we do not. In Hollywood, for example, we also represent caterers, Skid, and we also represent now, just recently, we organized the cook helpers. So the assistants to the catering uh, uh, department now are uh, members of Local 399. Uh, we do not uh, represent uh, theatrical uh, in Los Angeles at all. So we don't do any theater venues as uh, does New York. Uh, but there are other Teamster locals in Los Angeles that represent those workers. Well, thanks guys for clarifying. I think most people, when they hear Teamsters, think of the drivers. But being aware of all these other folks who are represented as well is very helpful. Let's turn our attention now to the current pandemic and how your membership specifically has been affected. Well, in New York, as I mentioned earlier, on, on March 13th, we had over 2,000 people working in motion picture, television, you know, commercial theater. And New York had just had its first death, New York City, and the, the mayor's uh, film office was going to stop issuing permits. It was at that time that pretty much things started to shut down across the country at that same time. So we went from 100% employed to, by next Monday, probably to about 98%. It's a kind of a technicality because the companies did issue what they considered to be severance or compassion pay. So technically, people were working longer, but physically, they were not. And that's similar to Los Angeles. Um, we basically, we, we weren't at full employment skid when, um, because January, February, those months tend to be a little bit slower here. There is, there's still a bit of a season here in Hollywood. Most of the production shut down. And as Tommy said, none of the companies really had a clear, concise plan as to how long they were going to uh, pay people beyond the termination. But literally the switch was flipped. And from one day to the next, from Friday to Monday, we were at, let's say, 80% employment on Friday. And uh, that, that following Monday, we were probably, uh, that was cut in half. And then it was quickly uh, shut down. The industry in Hollywood is, basically, our membership is, they're idle. There are a handful of people, if that, working currently in Hollywood. 
Yeah, I would mirror uh, both what Tommy and, and Steve said. Uh, I, I actually got a call from Steve on the Sunday, uh, March 15th, and he'd let me know that uh, he was closing his doors. And uh, I, I took that, uh, I did the same thing and just phoned staff and said, stay home. And we've been uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, cleaning up uh, things that, uh, projects that were left behind. The only people we have working right now is security. And so they're uh, watching some of the sets that have been pre-built. But we basically the same same scenario for us. So what's interesting about the entertainment industry is the work does come and go, I think. But when it disappears entirely, obviously there's a huge financial impact on your membership. While you may have some tools in place, what sort of challenges are you facing as a union and your membership facing given the unprecedented level of shutdown? We largely represent freelance workers. So if everything is shuttered, you know, there's no pay coming in. You know, the, one of the good things is that we're coming off of an unprecedented boom time for most locales that employment had been high for many years. So hopefully people did have something saved. But now people are faced with, you know, mortgage, rent, food bills, and we don't quite know when we're going to be coming back yet. So there's a great amount of anxiety and apprehension about when we will be coming back to work. I agree with, uh, with Tom that, that uh, this is an unprecedented, obviously, time for our industry. We're all used to having a couple of months off, having a hiatus. I think our more senior members are prepared, better prepared. But as Tommy alluded, the industry has expanded. Uh, over the last several years with the streaming companies coming online and more content, uh, more demand for content happening. So the concern I have are for the younger members, those folks that have just gotten in and over the last couple of three years who, who get work when everybody else is working because in the Teamsters, we're a little different uh, than most other unions in the sense that the drivers have to be dispatched in seniority order. So we still have, uh, we're probably one of the few unions left in the film industry that has any type of seniority system. So the way that it works in Hollywood is the drivers with the most seniority are dispatched first, followed by uh, what we refer to. Those are referred to as group one drivers. They have more than 10 years of experience. Uh, group two drivers have between two and 10 years of experience. And group three drivers have zero to two years of experience in the industry. So the group ones will generally, uh, will uh, most always work ahead of the other groups of drivers. So, so that's, I think, a little bit more difficult. It's a little more complicated. And those are the folks I worry about most, our senior drivers and, and our senior location folks and our other crafts. I think we're all, like you, Skid, probably used to working uh, and saving our money in between. We have done a few things uh, that I can talk about in a bit about what we've done to support our members. Uh, but I want to give Lori an opportunity to respond as well. I, I think the biggest difficulty is communicating with our members and being realistic. The information just on the virus itself, it just changes uh, from day to day. One minute you should don't wear a mask, next minute wear a mask. You know, so immediately for us, we uh, suspended the union dues, uh, froze the uh, health plan, so everybody would stay on that. And these are all short term, but just enough to kind of lessen that, that sudden impact. There's a group that is new and, you know, we have a grouping system too, but it's a name request world. Even within the groupings, it's, uh, you know, this is a gig mentality. You're guaranteed, uh, uh, for those that work uh, set, you're guaranteed a, a day, you're guaranteed a week, maybe on a, a, on a start pack if you're a head of department. So people are very resilient to anyone that's been in this business, but a group that's come in probably in the last five years, I can only speak for us, but uh, they've left other industries for the, you know, for, for what we have to offer, but uh, what we don't have to offer is security. So they've left industries where, you know, better pension, I can only speak for ourselves, better pension contributions and uh, a more of a seniority based if they're working from a trucking firm or something like that. So uh, those people I have concern with, uh, are, we also have members that have been around for 20 years that uh, struggle financially for, a myriad of reasons. So, uh, but just trying to get positive, uh, get messages out that are positive but realistic. Much like Steve in 399, my location workers and casting people are hired directly by the producer, but I also have a seniority based grouping system for my drivers, which are the, the vast majority of my membership. 
And I do really worry about those guys that came within the last five years about having a livelihood, at least in the near future, because when we do get the green light, we're not going to be coming back at 100%. It's going to take a while for it to get up and going again. Even though there's a tremendous pent-up demand for content, it's going to take a while for us to get back. I agree, again, with Tommy. Uh, I think the ramp-up may, may be a little slow because I think people are going to be concerned. Uh, you know, so I think there's going to be trepidation, and, and I think we have to get over the psychological aspect of being around other people uh, and feeling comfortable and at ease, because uh, I, I think a lot of people don't feel that way uh, any longer. Um, but uh, I am confident our industry is generally recession proof. I, I kind of equate this to a, a dance. So the crafts that we represent are used to doing a particular dance on set. They've gotten familiar with that dance. They know that change is, is part of the deal. Uh, upheaval change uh, uh, comes with the territory. So people are adaptable in our industry and they've, they've become accustomed to that dance. And I feel like now we have to learn new dance steps. So we have to learn the dance anew. It's a different dance, but our people are very adaptable. They're used to change. Uh, that's what we do every day. So I think they're gonna get used to this new dance and they will start to follow those protocols, but they have to learn those new protocols. But once we get those protocols down and hopefully um, uh, maintain a safe set uh, for a cast and crew and the public, the industry will slowly uh, will continue to reopen. It's funny because, you know, those protocols that Steve are talking about, and I do be- I honestly believe we're gonna, it's gonna take us a while to, to get back to where we were, but the protocols will actually in itself create some work because they can have to build in some hours of the day for these protocols that we're putting into place. And they're going to also want to sh- just shorten the day itself with the understanding that if you work a more decent and livable you know, work day, that people will be you know, better rested and the immune systems be up. So a 30-day shoot will, may now become a 40-day shoot. So... And if that's the case, then that's going to create jobs for other people. So there is a possibility that uh, we will actually have more work generated by the protocols that we put into place in you know, the age of the pandemic. But it will take a while to gear back up. Speaking of those protocols, tell me more about the Teamsters role in the actual development of those standards and planning. Uh, in other words, when there is this big change in the industry, there are a lot of players involved in those negotiations. I'd like to hear more about what the Teamsters are doing specifically. The Teamsters are part of an overall alliance. I think Governor Cuomo initially got the ball rolling by requesting from the studios a proposed return to work protocol. So it was incumbent upon you know the studios, who then called the MPTP, who then called the, the unions, the Teamsters, SAG-AFTRA, the Directors Guild, IOTC, they're all uh, meeting to come up with policy protocols. We're generating a, a uh, what we're calling a white paper to be given to Cuomo, hopefully by this Monday the 1st, and then to Governor Newsom at the same time or shortly thereafter. But all the both producers and, and unions are, are now working together to come up with common protocols and guidelines for returning to work. Yeah, and just to add to that, I, I would say that um, what we've been doing uh, in addition to those measures is we've also, as you probably know, Skid, uh, for the below the line uh, workers for the IATSE and Teamster covered uh, crafts as well as others, we're covered under the motion picture industry uh, health plans and pension plans. So we have taken measures to waive premium payments, extend benefit hours, allow people a hardship withdrawal of their 401k portions of their pensions. Local 399 has allowed our members to go on withdrawal. They, they have the option in our industry. We've always allowed our uh, members to go on withdrawal in Hollywood because if there isn't work, uh, they can just uh, go on withdrawal and they don't have to pay dues until they come back to work. We've also, um, we have a communications program uh, that I think is second to none. And we've been uh, communicating Every day with our membership, we've been uh, reaching out uh, through Zoom meetings. I think we all, we've all come to resent Zoom meetings in a way. 
but uh, it's all good. Uh, it's the new norm. And so we've had a town hall meeting. We've met with our shop stewards virtually and with literally all of our committees. And we set up a, a 399 recovery fund where we set aside a half a million dollars, uh, up to a half a million dollars out of our treasury that we have given to the Motion Picture and Television Fund to help our members, uh, Teamster families in need. Uh, it provides a grant of up to $1,000 uh, per uh, Teamster family that applies. Uh, we're also doing a food drive this uh, Friday, May 29th, and everyone is welcome to participate in that. Anybody who works in the film industry or who may be nearby there, uh, it is the Teamsters and Basic Crafts food drive that's being done in conjunction with Labor Community Services. Um, we're planning on handing out 1,200 boxes of food uh, in about four or five hours uh, to people in need. So those are some of the things uh, that we've been doing. Because I think right now, as Tommy alluded to and Lori did, we need to make sure that our members know uh, that we're working, that all of our uh, folks are working. They're working on different aspects of the uh, industry and that we're focused on getting our membership back to work as quickly and as safely as possible. And I know that's true for all of us and the industry at large. You know, at 817, the first thing that we did in the middle of March was suspend dues for all members during any month where their employment was impacted by, by the coronavirus. And as Steve also talked about, too, you know, so all my location and casting people on the motion picture plan out in the West Coast, which Steve himself is a trustee and, and they have several of the trustees on there. So with his help, you know, we've have gotten some relief. Obviously, if people are also concerned about, you know, paying their bills, the, the, they're definitely concerned about maintaining their health coverage. And they have at least been given some assurances now in the short term that that's going to be maintained. In uh, the drivers in New York, they accrue eligibility on a, a calendar basis. So everybody that has um, that accrued it from 2019 has it for an entire year going forward. The trustees are now going to be looking at how many days that we will actually be out of work, and we will probably make some accommodations to take that into account. Also, what Steve was talking about is, and I, this is something that I'm really proud of our members, is obviously everybody's out of work, but I had over 200 people that were volunteering their services, any relief efforts. They were involved in manufacturing face shields and masks and supplying them to area hospitals. They were providing meals for healthcare workers on the front lines. And now that that is kind of quieted down in New York, it's now been converted to what they're calling TV dinners. It's getting meals to uh, the elderly that can't really leave their residences and, and people in, in financial need. And that's continuing on today. Lori, do you want to add on to anything? Um, yeah, we've been uh, trying to be active there. We've, I think we're in day, uh, we, we started um, a couple months ago. We delivered over 100,000 meals, uh, hot meals, to uh, uh, residents of uh, single resident occupancy, SROs, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is uh, certainly the poorest uh, uh, postal code in, in Canada. Uh, so that's that's been uh, rewarding. Uh, we were able to help the Ports uh, Canada uh, acquire uh, washrooms and facilities for drivers because all of a sudden that we had that little period there where drivers had nowhere to use any facilities. And uh, so we, we've tried to be active doing that. We have our staff and our uh, field stewards uh, phoning our members and just checking in on them. Uh, certainly mental health is uh, is really the greatest concern. We 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 think we've seen that impact in a in a very severe way, uh, which uh, I won't get into. But uh, two years ago, all the unions we got together and we started uh, a website called Call Time Mental Health. It's now a society, and uh, I certainly um, would highly recommend it to uh, anybody that's listening that wants to. You know, it, some of it's specific to the, the unions and, and how they can um, get at some of the health plans that are available. But there's a lot of general information on mental health and addiction. Um, you know, that's one of the uh, consequences of what we're going through. I, I think it, it should never be uh, overlooked. As far as what are the unions are doing up here, uh, we have various groups we put together working with WorkSafe BC to put uh, guidelines in place. Uh, similar, uh, you know, the governments want white papers and, and high-level documents, and the details are going to be left up to us. Um, no matter what we do, our, our members will probably have to make that decision until this pandemic's over. 
that when you do go back to work, there's no guarantee of your safety, no more than there is when you go shopping for groceries. So until that's over, there's only a limit to what we can do. Those real issues and how we get uh, the uh, crew to set and back inside an enclosed vehicle, um, that's kind of all up for you know debate yet. And I know um, yeah, your group uh, down south has uh, hired an epidemiologist. I think that's fantastic. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what the group puts together, each individual company will still have their own specific uh, uh, protocol in place. And then the real work, as Steve had said, that's when the work's going to be is when uh, uh, the boots hit the ground. And uh, you know, how do we um, you know make sure that everybody's complying? And uh, when someone coughs or sneezes and gets told to go home, who's paying that person? So, you know, th that's the, uh, the, de the devil's in the details for sure. And so I, I, I want to make sure that's not, uh, that, that's my concern. And I'm sure it's, it's everyone's concern. I would say I have three categories of members. One is those people that are anxious to get back to work. And those are the same people that would say, where's my liability waiver so I can sign it and work now. And then there's, those people, they're actually anxious about working, you know, they're concerned about their health and the health of their families. And then there's the group that is anxious to get back to work as soon as possible and also anxious about the conditions that they encounter when they get back to work. And that's what, you know, the three of us are focused on right now and, and the industry as a whole, because we do want to get them back to work as soon as possible but we want to make sure that every safeguard is put into place to protect not only just our members, but also the public at large in which we work. Tommy and I are on weekly CEO calls with the heads of the other uh, guilds and unions in the industry. Uh, we are working collaboratively like never before, all the unions, uh, as well as with the uh, studios. And I think we have a good working relationship. Obviously, there are concerns on both sides of the table. I think we have more questions than answers. Uh, but look, I feel to Lori's point, you know, getting in a car, driving a car, someone gave me this analogy that driving in a car, crossing the street, flying on an airplane, all have inherent risks, but we still get on them. So I think our jobs, because we cannot, we will not be able to assure our members entirely, Skid, that, that their work environment is going to be safe. We can't. All we can do realistically at this point in time is try to make sure that we've put in every protocol that we can to protect our members and crew. I think for me, the biggest concern, and I, I know this is true for, for my colleagues as well as the industry, is cast members will not be able to wear PPE in front of the camera. They're obviously gonna have to take off whatever they have on. If they've got makeup on, masks are a problem. All of those uh, concerns, you know, how they get made up, all of these things have to be discussed. It's a new workflow. And we have to figure out that new workflow. So we're just going to have to make sure that we put every protocol that we can into place and make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to protect our, our workers, uh, our cast, and, and uh, the public at large. In, in discussing the challenge that we face in coming up with these protocols, I find some reassurance in the idea that these negotiations are happening with multiple unions uh, at a national or even a cross-border level so that we're not subject to what this locale or what that locale might decide for various reasons. Let's talk more about how coordination between unions is helping to get us where we need to be on this. Yeah, I, I don't mind saying right off the bat, that's, that's a key to me. I don't want uh, productions coming here just because it's laxer. I mean, if the curve is lower, I mean, that, that's just what it is uh, in the moment. But uh, that's important to me, that, that this protocol should be equally strict uh, throughout the country. And, and I really think uh, the majority of the companies, even in their investors, aren't going to take that kind of chance either. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to come back to work and shut the industry down, obviously. So we, wanna, we, we really want to try to make this work because uh, I think we all recognize that if the industry shuts down because of COVID outbreaks, it's going to make it that much harder for us to continue to work. So we want to put the best protocols and guidance in place and it should be a standard um, that is done nationally. And I think uh, all the guilds and unions, as far as I'm aware, are committed to that. And again, I have to thank the other guilds and unions uh, for their collaboration and support during this process. We've all been very thoughtful. We've all 
you know, been straight with each other. And those are difficult conversations to have at times, uh, but they're fruitful. And um, I think uh, the guidelines that we put out will be uh, a reflection of that. On the union side, even if we believe that the producer employer doesn't have the health and welfare of our members at their highest priority, I do believe they understand that their health is tied together with their financial you know, sustainability. Like Steve mentioned, you can't begin a show and then have an actor get sick, shut down for three weeks or more, or you have a crew member get sick uh, having been exposed to other crew and possibly cast and then shut down for, you know, two to three weeks. It's not financially sustainable. So, you know, I believe that everybody is in this together. I believe that we're going to come up with a protocol that's the gold standard for North America. You know, we've all gotten calls from independents and, you know, the teleperries that, you know, they want to come back sooner than later and they have their own protocols. But, it's going to be what we come up with. I think that rules the day. And as Steve mentioned, you know, especially with the, the actors have to be comfortable because they're the ones that are standing up there naked um, and at the most exposed in this. Uh, we have no nudity in Canada. Just so you know, typical Canadians. <laughs> when I said the cast was standing there naked. I meant they, they, they were naked without PPE. I, not because they didn't have any clothes on. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. And I believe that part of the protocols that we're putting in place uh, will include testing. I think that's critical um, in order to get this done. I believe testing is important. And so, so hopefully that will be, uh, you know, uh, part of this protocol. I think it's important. So we're going to do everything we can to protect our members. And I think the industry understands that. And as Tommy said, you know, my big concern uh, is for our cast members who, uh, you know, will not be able to do this. I can tell you that the epidemiologists, and there are a bunch of epidemiologists that are involved in this. So this isn't just the studios and the unions getting together and having conversations about this. We have engaged epidemiologists. We have explained to them exactly what we do, what every department does on set so that they can, because they don't know the industry, right? So they had to understand what we did before they could comment. And one of the suggestions they're making, which I found interesting, was the use of face shields instead of face masks. And I actually, after thinking about it, kind of preferred a face shield, because if you think about it, a face shield protects your eyes and your nose and mouth. Two, you can see the other person. You know, they're not hiding under a mask. So... You get to see their expressions. I think that psychologically is important, uh, believe it or not, that you can see people's expressions. And, uh, and in situations where you have to, you can don a mask and have the face shield on as well for extra protection if you're working near a cast member who can't put on uh, personal protective equipment. So I think the protocols are going to be robust. And uh, I think the crews will abide by these uh, protocols. And they will once they get used to it, and comfortable with it, I think the efficiency of production on set, because as Tommy alluded, it's gonna take us longer, but I have confidence in our crews that they will be able to figure out safe and effective workarounds. And uh, you know, that's what we do. We MacGyver things in the film industry and we're very creative and we'll, we'll get this done. We will find the right protocols. One of our biggest challenges is gonna be uh, when this protocol starts bumping up to our collective agreement. And I think, um, I think that will be one of our big challenges. Uh, but, you know, this is just, uh, I, think, I think Tom said it uh, a while ago, uh, we're on Mars. We're walking on Mars. We've never been here before. So uh, we have a resilient bunch. We're a resilient bunch. And, uh, you know, one day this will be all past us. And uh, hopefully uh, we can still work in the meantime while it's still, uh, still active. To be clear for the purpose of this podcast, the white paper that state and local governments will be getting is just going to give them a comfort level that this light manufacturing industry, and I, I, I call it a light manufacturing industry because, you know, a lot of these states have like various phases of return to work. In New York, Governor Cuomo has labeled it as being entertainment is phase four. Now, certainly um, concerts and theater is stage four, but I believe that TV and film is actually phase three, maybe even late stage, you know, two. We're just giving them the reassurance that we're protecting both our own workers and the public to the necessary degree. 
there will be a conversation after this with the producers about how any protocols or policies might affect, you know, collective bargaining agreements. And that's where I feel that all unions will be, at least on the big points, will be on the same page. I agree with Tommy. Uh, this is a two-step process. First, we have to get the guidelines out for cities and states so that they can review our guidelines, make sure that they're the protocols that they agree with them or any changes they'd like us to make. While they're doing that, we will be having conversations with the uh, employers to figure out how we adapt our collective bargaining agreements, if we adapt them at all, uh, to this new environment, what it looks like. I think the unions are willing to be flexible. We're willing to be flexible, but we also want to make sure that we're protecting the rights and the working conditions of our memberships. Well, it's clear that this is an ongoing challenge uh, and that we have to keep an eye on both uh, current conditions and an eye on what's coming down in the future. Uh, if folks want to learn more, either uh, members who may have questions to follow up or folks who aren't in the industry but want to learn more about what you're doing, are there resources or sites or contact numbers you guys would like to share? Sure. Uh, so uh, at Local 399, uh, anyone, public or uh, a member, can go to our website, which is HT, like Hollywood Teamsters, HT399.org, uh, or they can call our office at area code 818. 985-7374 to talk to a staff member with any questions or concerns. Um, if any, if any teams are in, in motion picture TV realm, they can go to IBT.org, uh, click on to uh, under divisions, the motion picture, and there should be allowance for them to leave a question. I check it periodically and would be happy to you know, get back with an answer or what my best answer with any questions I'd get. Um, I have both Tom and Steve's cell phone numbers. I don't know if it'd be appropriate <laughs> at this time, but uh, go ahead, go ahead, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy's um, first, please. Five 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 five. Yeah. So, so for us, uh, it's Teamsters Local One Five Five dot org. And again, I, I really um, encourage anyone to take a look at that call time mental health uh, dot com website. Uh, there's lots of um, information there for. Uh, the way we look at it is uh, we say uh, for those that uh, want to help, those that need help. Um, there's also an incredible PSA that was done by volunteers where uh, people really uh, opened their heart and uh, gave testimonies for some of the stuff they've experienced, both with uh, suicide and, and addiction. So I, I, and I really thank you for uh, uh, including me in this uh, today. Appreciate it. All of you, thanks for sharing that information uh, for our listeners. Final question, looking ahead, tell me what the future looks like. You know, it's, as Steve mentioned earlier, the industry is a depression, recession-proof industry. I mean, heck, we saw Netflix stock go up 7% in one day. There's a tremendous amount of pent-up demand for content. It is a somewhat pandemic-sensitive industry. But there is such tremendous desire to get back. And I'm encouraged because Cuomo has been one of the most conservative governors out there. And he's initiated this, this conversation between all the unions and guilds in the studios. And we, the unions, will get you back to work. And we're going to make sure that when we do get you back to work, you're going to have every safeguard uh, made available to you. Steve? Thanks, Tom. One thing that I will say is, is I'm so grateful that I have a union and that we're represented by a union because I fear for those workers in our economy who have no voice, who have no real representation. Certainly, I think members in the film industry or any member who has a union behind them, they have more resources. Uh, and so I'm grateful uh, to that. I'm optimistic that our industry is going to come back stronger than ever. It's just going to, people have to be patient. It's going to take a little while for people to get over their concerns and their fears we are going to get back to work and we will get back to 100% employment. My, my hope is that uh, as we go through this and as we're done, it's probably a kinder workplace and a, a more um, organized workplace like it used to be. Um, I think things really did get out of control and this, this, there's a lot of positives that could come out of this. Look, the union set the bar. The union set the bar for non-union workers too no one does a better job representing uh, workers than the Teamsters. So that's what we're here for. That's what we're going to do. We will get through this. One last point, Skid. If we can navigate a supermarket and a Costco and stay safe, I think we can navigate a film set and keep everybody safe. 
Guys, thanks very much for being here today. It's been great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Skip. Thank you. Listeners, I'm always grateful for your feedback. You can send your email comments to skid, S-K-I-D, at blowtheline, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. Please rate us wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help us reach new listeners. And if you yourself are a new listener, I hope you'll check out some other episodes. If you're on Facebook, you can find photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at Podcast Below the Line. And finally, you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram. It's at Pod Below the Line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Wan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. Be safe out there. Hope to see everyone again next week. I know Steve, ahead, loves, Steve loves to talk, so I know he's definitely going to say something. I do get tired with that brush, Skid. That is true. <laughs> I am a talker. He's right. I was expecting more ball busting during the course of it, guys. So that's kind of yeah, what yeah, uh, I know. We you were guys very were gentle with each other. other. Yeah. Yeah, it's true.